Hi, it's Rick Lobb with Homefield Group and Jeff Bauer for another edition of the Real Talk podcast. And today we have a close friend of mine, Jeremiah Summer from Summer Brother Construction. And we wanted to get Jeremiah here because he's involved in a very interesting project that um, that we are also extremely fascinated about. Uh, we'll get Jeremiah to comment further on it. But to get started, Jeremiah, I know personally uh, well because Jeremiah built my house. And through that process, we often discussed about efficiencies and you know how to build a house with emerging technology um, and to make a house as as airtight and as insulated and as efficient as possible. And so I know that Jeremiah has been interested in in building high performance housing uh, for years. And uh, and now he's about to embark on uh, a project of his own that that we're fascinated by and we'll get Jeremiah to talk more about. So why don't you tell us about sort of what you are embarking on and uh, and how it came to be? Sure. Yeah. So the uh, the project that we're doing is uh, it's kind of a small community uh, project where the goal was to um, develop uh, single family housing um, and steer the price range as close to sort of the attainable range. We're seeing a lot of uh, the market is going kind of crazy yep. right now, and it's getting really hard for young families to get into that. Um, and so we had an opportunity to purchase some land uh, and with the idea that the land was being made available to be developed uh, into housing that sort of fit the lower end of the market, more available to as many you know, younger families as possible. And like, of course, we were interested to do it because um, you know we work with families all the time, and we can see that that's obviously a need. But we didn't really have the desire to build um, lower cost housing for the sake of adding lower cost housing to the environment, we or to the to the inventory. So we uh, we we said we'd we'd consider the project. Um, kind of with the caveat that we would explore high performance um, and you know, sort of passive or close to passive house levels of construction, essentially meaning you know, really airtight homes that are you know, durable and healthy and, and extremely efficient at the yeah. end of the day. On that note, so on that note, why don't we, when you reference passive housing, like what, what makes a house passive or what makes passive housing? So passive house, uh, for a long time, I think people might, anybody that's kind of familiar with the term may think of it as like passive solar, where the idea is you're trying to get as much of the, the heat gain into the house from solar. Passive house is a little bit different from that in terms of, in, in the sense that it really is the idea of um, passive heating and cooling system. So the house is extremely airtight. So we're talking about airtightness levels that are, um, you know, six to eight times better than what a, a code house, a uh, code built house would be today. Uh, super insulated walls and in terms of like sort of getting into the weeds of construction a little bit, but eliminating things like thermal bridging. So there's a lot of design elements that go into that to kind of get to that level. And kind of the result of that is, uh, part of that too is the, in the HVAC system, um, delivering you know, a constant supply of clean air into that. Because it's so yeah, airtight, so airtight, you've yeah. got to be able to manage that. So it's kind of uh, controlling the, uh, the elements of the house that you know, maybe have been controlled through leaky sections in buildings before. So on a normal code built house, let's say the exterior wall would have an R value of? So typically with code requires about an R19 insulation in between the studs and then a continuous insulation on the outside. Most people, if they're seeing construction go up in their neighborhood, are probably gonna see houses with maybe like a silver foam kind of material on the outside and that's a continuous insulation, which is really important and it's a valuable, um, which gives it like a combined R value of somewhere around 24, 25. Okay, and then compare that to then a, let's say a passive home. Yep. The exterior wall would have an R value of? Uh, 45 and oh, wow. so considerably more. Now, part of that comes into the design with windows too. Like windows um, 
code requires windows to hit certain R values where passive levels go way up too. So it's the whole wall package that kind of gets there, but it's exceeding R45 and really depends. The other thing that we found really interesting about that, uh, this method of construction is that it's really suited to where it's going to be. So where, you know, an Ontario building code, it's pretty standard almost anywhere you go in Ontario. I mean, maybe exception of like far north, it might be a little bit different, but generally the, the requirements are kind of the same. Where passive is really dialed in to the location. Maybe it's near water where you're getting, you know, maybe more wind or maybe it's different parts of the province or the country determine, you know, insulation values and, and things like that. So how, how do you determine, like, so a passive home, is there a, does it come as a, like you say that it's different for different parts of the province or location wise, how, how is that determined whether it's, you know, whether you're going to use this material or that material, is it, does it get tested in that environment or like, how does it, how do they know that this is going to work as a, as a passive home, be it in a different environment or compared to the, to the Ontario building code, like how, how do the two compare in terms of how they're like first, I guess, designed and then tested to know that like a high performance home or passive home is going to, going to outlast and, and be that much more economical. How does, how does that, how does that break down like in terms of just testing and the pre-work and design and that sort of stuff? So that's, that's another thing that kind of drew us to this was the idea that the home is, is designed and like in terms of the actual, uh, even right down to the actual, the, the shape and the direction that, you know, windows are facing uh, and, and all of that kind of gets designed for the location that it's in. And, and those designs, you know, are, end up becoming uh, models that the house is, has to hit to. So that, so that those models determine the, the heating and cooling systems. They determine the, the window insul the window quality that has to be in there. But, and also the air tightness, which is probably one of the biggest, the biggest deals with that is it, it, you have to get the air tightness down such a low amount that has to be tested to be verified. So that testing happens at different stages of construction. Where currently with a typical code house, there's none of that. None of, none of that air testing um, or performance testing happens. It's sort of generally assumed that if you're you know, hitting code requirements, you're getting there. But when you get dealing with like a passive house level, that testing happens multiple times throughout the, the project. Did I, so I think I saw in your social media, there was something with a door and there was like a piece of tarp or plastic over it. What did, what was I seeing there? I, w I wasn't quite sure. I was kind of scrolling through and saw it, but what, so what, that would have been part of this sort of thing. Yeah. Explain, explain what I was seeing. And, you know, I think that would have been on Summer Brothers uh, social media. So yeah. go check it out, but explain what we would have seen. So that's our kind of newest toy. Right. Basically, yeah, that's a blower door. System. Okay. So the idea is, that um, fan and that sort of um, you know canvas material that you saw in there that inserts into a door or window depending on on the house and the idea is you depressurize the house so what we were doing there was we were depressurizing the house to it, it, the terminology would be to 50 pascal so there's a 50 pascal pressure difference between outside air and inside air and then once you've got the house depressurized it it's obviously going to start leaking wherever there are leaks. So the, it's the way to test air tightness. So in that case, we were testing the skin of the house. We wanted to know how tight our enclosure was. And then we will do that again at the end once everything is complete. So we did that at like pre-drywall stage. So it's kind of like two-part testing in order to sort of verify at that stage uh, while we could still repair things if yeah. we had to, uh, as opposed to just doing it at the end where repairs or you know changes are a lot more difficult. So that's just part of the uh, the validation essentially that we're looking for, and it's and that's something that we'll implement on projects regardless of, of sort of the performance level that we're shooting for. Renovations, it's, it's ideal because you can go into an existing home, run those tests ahead of time, and then perform the, uh, the renovation alterations and get a sense of how you land and, and, and how much improvement yeah. you've made on the house. Is that, just, is that the same sort of thing that like an energy auditor mm -hmm. would use? Like there's these government grants for retrofits and those sorts of things. Is that the same sort of equipment yeah. that they would use? Okay, yeah. that yeah. makes sense. So if, um, as far as, let's say the materials used, mm -hmm. Uh, am I going to see a massive difference in materials used from a passive house versus a con 
you know, a stick built house N in not, any typical subdivision? No, not necessarily. You're, you're going to have asphalt shingles, you're going to have yeah. maybe brick or stone or, or wood siding. Yeah, yeah, really. The materials don't matter. They don't matter in terms of getting a house to meet the targets of passive house. They matter more in terms of like the environmental impact that the materials have. So we, that's another thing that we're exploring and trying to make sure that part of the builds where possible that like things like embodied carbon and things like that into a house get reduced. So while, yeah, we could use pretty much all the standard materials that you would see most code houses built out of, and that could be used to perform really well. Um, we're going to try and, you know, source materials that have a little bit more positive impact um, on the long term. So uh, from a time standpoint, a mm -hmm. timing standpoint, is there going to be a significant difference in time spent in construction, building a passive house versus uh, standard? Um, not necessarily. So one of the things that makes uh, building to sort of like a passive uh, level of construction is simplicity in the design. So which usually means a little bit, uh, you know, maybe not a house that has a lot of extra exterior corners and jut outs and, and, and features that are hard to detail and, uh, and hard to air seal, harder to work with. Not that it can't be done, it's just ideally you would simplify the design a little bit and then, and then use aesthetics to to um, you know, create the curb appeal that's necessary for that. So we don't necessarily have to take longer because it, it depends on the finish levels, I guess. If, if the finish levels in the house are really high end and detailed, that takes a long time too. But I think it could be comparable, maybe a little longer than a standard sort of code build house that doesn't have, you know, the sort of mid-level kind of finishes. So one of the reasons that we wanted you on here is because the, the, the cost of, of what you're building mm -hmm you are wanting that to stay in an attainable yep. zone when you're finished. That's right. And like, do you, can you comment on sort of a price range of where you see this thing ending up at? Well, so a lot of the sort of estimates that uh, people have produced for sort of in terms of the percentage difference between a code build house, for example, and a passive house are somewhere in the five to 10% of an increase. Okay. We'd like to try and target, you know, end costs, um, you know, in the maybe mid to high 400s range. It's maybe a bit of a, a tall order to, but we think that we can sort of value engineer the project to be able to sort of redistribute um, the, the budget to certain aspects of this. We feel like making, making things like the air tightness level, the insulations, the windows, the skin and the shell of the building, which are really hard to change later, and nobody wants to change any of those things, making that the priority, and, and then re sort of thinking how the finishes end up so that um, we can use the money that's in the budget for the house to um, you know, focus on maybe, I want to call them more important because that's subjective. Well, performance, but you're not putting $50,000 countertops into, right. into yeah, a house. There are like ways to stuff. sort of yeah. uh, alloc reallocate funds yeah. in a project to be able to take advantage of some of those things that you don't want to have to do later again. That you might do later, anyways, you because, might. because of people's design and how people's right. preferences change, right. anyways, with yeah. those sorts of things. The, so, square footage wise, uh, like what kind of square footage footprint are you going to be looking at as far as like if somebody I mean let's just say on the on the uh, the, the generous end if you said like mid to high 400 range mm -hmm. so let's say let's call it a $500,000 house mm -hmm. how large of a square footage footprint are you going to be getting for that kind of a dollar figure so right now the design we're working on is about an 18 to 1900 square foot a story and a half house so we're looking at three bedroom plus an office, could be another bedroom um, sort of feature. So the, 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 the project right now is looking at a, a story and a half with no basement, which a lot of people instantly sort of have asked us, you know, what, what about not having a basement? Where does stuff go? Uh, we're looking at it more like uh, instead of building a bungalow, which is very common, uh, right now, very popular that have basements. We're looking at basically building a you know a bungalow with a second floor. So we're just essentially changing the living space from basement area to a second floor where you can have a little bit nicer views. And uh, basements are getting a lot more expensive to construct than they used to be in order to be able to hit even code. 
requirements, let alone passive house levels, which by eliminating the basement can uh, increase efficiency and performance uh, substantially. So yeah, we're looking at about 18, 1900 square feet, three bedrooms. And one of the things too we want to we want to do with this is sort of future proof the house as much as we possibly can. So that going net zero with solar, the infrastructure is you know in place so that it takes minimal um, extra cost to be able to add that at some point or even aging in place features where you know maybe there's three bedrooms upstairs and but you have an office slash guest room den whatever on the main floor but could be converted to a main floor bedroom so should somebody choose to you know want to spend the whole their whole life there like the idea is to make the house flexible so that it can be uh, used by a variety of uh, of people, whether that's a young family or, you know, eventually, ideally, it'd be great if people would stay there for, for a really long time. It doesn't always happen, but at least the infrastructure is kind of put in place so that those costs can be minimized later without having to do major changes. Yeah, we, I mean, obviously, when in real estate, we look at, at um, when we uh, evaluate property, we look at the highest and best use of a property. and. And that's sort of what you base a, a evaluation on is what can this best be used for? And so the more use, the w more open and wide your use is, the, the higher the value is. Yep. And if you can, you know, we always say that like a, for example, a three bedroom house is always gonna be more valuable than a two bedroom house, just yep. simply because, you know, you have more options in a three bedroom house versus a two bedroom house. So to have a, you know, to keep that in mind with this project is smart that, and obviously you're doing that, you're making it available to somebody who maybe has mobility issues or is a little bit older, and you're also making it available to a young family that has a few kids, so. Right. And you had mentioned the future-proofing as well. At one point you had uh, mentioned just the, the, the home's placement on the lot and how that can have a big factor on the ability to, to add on or put additions on, a pro because if we, if we build right out to you know, your, your setback from the side lot, yep. uh, and then design the house in such a way that you can't add rooms on, is that, how does that work? Like, so are you thinking more like centering on a lot as opposed to putting big backyard, or how does that, how does that work with a project like this? That is exactly the kind of thing that we want to make uh, possible too, because we realize that it's not a massive house by the, a lot of today's standards, but uh, we didn't want to create a situation where the house was placed on a lot purely from the curb appeal standpoint. I mean, that's really important, but we wanted it to sort of, we wanted to design the lot and the layout of the lot to accommodate whether that's an attached or detached garage or a small addition off of the back of the house. So if there's septic involved, we wanted to make sure that that septic system was put as far away from the house as possible so that nothing had to be moved or altered or if the septic system, you know, needs to be sized up slightly to be able to accommodate a future expansion, it can because we've run into that before where people have added to a house and had to, you know, completely redo a septic system or get variances because the space they need is too close to the property line because that wasn't thought about before. So we're kind of trying to start from, you know, a position of where where we think a pr the property could be developed to and then scale back the items to be able to kind of achieve the main goal is to achieve the is achieve the home at an at an as most affordable kind of rate as we can but not tie people back from being able to add to the property a little bit if, if in in the future oh that's interesting uh so i guess final thoughts this project is underway currently it's in the design stage right now. So we've purchased the land uh, now, which is two lots to kind of sort of get our feet wet, I guess. Uh, and we're working with a company out of Nova Scotia right now who's putting together our designs, which I think will probably have sort of a final on in the next month or so, and then we can now, actually start. Just on that note, yep. is it, like, it going to look drastically different than houses that you would typically see around here? Not, not if we can help it. We, I, okay. I, the goal is to make it, we don't, I mean, we'd want people to have to, to know that the house was designed differently. We don't want it to, it doesn't need to stand out like some kind of, you know, super modern spaceship style house, which I think a lot of people think as soon as you start talking right. about, you know, uh, alternative designs, which are really cool and I would be great to build one of those. And that's not for everybody. We realize that. And so the idea is to fit it in within the community 
so that it that it well it also should have um, you know some symbiosis with the community like it should look like it was part of that and not just sort of plunked in there so we want to stay and make a connection with where it's going um, and unless you really observe it and notice extra deep window sills or something like that because the walls are thicker you know generally it's probably not going to be noticeable to anybody unless unless they've been told ahead of time I think that the like and this might come off as a little bit corny, but I think that my favorite part about the project is the the reason why you have decided to do this, and it's it's out of your your passion for not only the the passive housing, but but also the the environment and the location. Like mm -hmm. you and I both have a, a deep connection to that yep. to, to that area uh, of the county, so it's I think it's very commendable that you're taking you know when when a lot of when a lot of the you know, business world is looking at the bottom line. Mm -hmm. There's a different bottom line that you guys are considering in, you know, the future proofing of the place, the, the environment and, uh, and the ability for, for a, a family, you know, with, you know, just general means to be able to afford it. So kudos to you guys for, for taking on the project. And I did cut you off because we didn't get to the part of the completion date, when do you figure something like this, the first one, let's say, will be finished? The goal would be before the end of this year. So a project starting sometime in the, in the summer with, a, with a, you know, the goal to be able to have it complete um, before the end of the year. And, and one of the things that I'll just mention with that is in order to sort of um, help explain the process to people, which I don't, not that many people are familiar with, we, we will want to be able to make it as open source as we can. Like we're, we're certainly no, it's not, you know, it's not our own prized information that we're, we're using to build it. I mean, it's, it's widely known, but we want to make this an open project for members of the community and or people who are just curious. So there will be opportunity, you know, along the way to be able to host an open house partway through construction too, so people can kind of see what, oh, yeah. that's, what that's going to look like, you know, get the, you see the nuts and bolts of the whole thing. That'll be part of it, but yeah, ideally if, you know, the world circumstances are what they are, but the goal would be to have you know something complete at least first stage, kind of by the end of the year. So there you have it. Somebody can come along, buy an attainable, passive, high-performance house for a family member for Christmas present, December twenty twenty-two. <laughs> the marketing builds itself. Unreal. <laughs> Make sure you follow Summer Brothers High Performance on social media. There's been lots of cool stuff. You can watch the cool canvas video with the <laughs> the blower the, door. The blower door, <laughs> uh, and. You'll probably be featuring things along the along the way yeah. with uh, with this project as well. So make sure you give them a follow on social media. Yeah. And uh, Jeremiah, thanks for yeah. coming in. Thanks for having me. Yep. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Real Talk. Mm -hmm.